Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Watershed University. Welcome to the second webinar in the flood risk management webinar series. The California Silver Jackets Collaborative Flood Risk Program is hosting this Watershed University webinars as part of its California wildfire, post wildfire flood education project. My name is Samson Hales Lassie, and I work with the California Department of Water Resources. I'm the state deputy for the California Silver Jackets. These webinars are targeted mainly at community leaders and decision makers working in floodplain management, but also at anyone interested in learning more about um, better risk communication management. Next slide, please. So these graphics shows the four stages in a typical disaster management life cycle. We cover this in these webinars within the context of flood risk preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. A few weeks ago, we had our first webinar in this series, one focused on preparedness. And webinar number two today will focus on the response stage of the flood risk management life cycle. More specifically, a local community perspective on post-fire flooding response. Next slide, please. Here's the program for today's webinar. We'll start with a brief overview of the California Silver Jackets program, and then we'll have the feature presentation by Santa Barbara County Flood Control and Conservation District for about 30 minutes, and hopefully we'll, afterwards we'll have time for questions and answers, and we'll wrap up and conclude by 12.30. But first, I'll turn it over to Denis Olson from the Army Corps of Engineers for the brief um, Silver Jack is over the presentation. Denise. Great. Thank you so much, Samson. Good morning, everyone. My name is Denae Olson. I work with the Army Corps of Engineers out of the Sacramento District and help with project management under the Silver Jackets program. And I'm going to just take a quick few minutes to tell you about Silver Jackets. Perhaps it's your first time hearing about uh, the program. And um, if you have any questions after this presentation, feel free to add those to the chat. Um, and we'll be leaving some contact information in the event that you're interested in maybe a future project through Silver Jackets for your community. Um, so looking forward to telling you all about it. Uh, so Silver Jackets is an interagency program uh, with a common goal to reduce flood risk. So. The uh, teams are state led. Um, there's a total of 54 Silver Jackets teams across the US. There's 50 uh, state uh, specific teams, three territory teams, and then a team in DC. And the first team was formed in 2005 in Ohio. Um, and then since then, <clears throat> these other teams have all been developed. Uh, the California Silver Jackets team signed their charter in 2016, and since that time, we've had um, some great projects um, initiated and completed, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about what kind of projects we do under Silver Jackets. Um, so the team is comprised of uh, interagency work and kind support. So the, the project itself is 100% federally funded. Um, in terms of the uh, labor that is provided from the core, um, but the teams are made up of um, other entities. So we'll have uh, representatives from FEMA, Cal OES, um, Department of Water Resources, um, often uh, county, different county representatives and cities. Um, just depending on the project, um, the, the teams may have uh, 10 or so interagency partners in some cases. And the projects uh, move really quickly. Um, they, the proposals are typically submitted in the springtime. So we just finished uh, submitting our fiscal year 2024 proposals. Um, at the end of March, we sent those in and we should be hearing um, sometime in July, which of those projects were selected for funding. Um, and if uh, selected, those projects will initiate in the October, November timeframe of this year. Um, and so we're always looking for additional project ideas. And um, so putting that out there today, if, if anyone hears about something that they're interested in, we hope that you'll reach out um, and we can uh, see if there's something we can't put a project together for. Okay, 
Um, so similar to how we have designed our webinar series, uh, the flood risk management life cycle um, is um, using the flood risk management life cycle. Uh, Silver Jackets addresses each of these stages of the life cycle, preparation and training, response, recovery, and mitigation. Um, so today's webinar is gonna focus on response, um, but under Silver Jackets, we can uh, provide different technical and um, non-structural services that fall under each of the uh, stages of the life cycle. And the projects move across the collaboration continuum. So um, we're each coming with our uh, different services and sectors uh, from our agencies and uh, entities that we're with, and we coexist. Uh, but through the Silver Jackets projects, uh, we have increased communication and collaboration leading to partnership. And the end result is um, flood risk management that leaves a has a collective impact new organizational services um, and integrated organizational services. So I'm gonna quickly run through these slides uh, here just to show you, to flash on kind of a few examples of interagency Silver Jackets projects that have been developed uh, by Silver Jackets teams. So we can do floodplain mapping and hazard assessments under Silver Jackets. Uh, so if a community is aware of a flood problem that they have, a recurring flood problem, um, we could have a project with uh, technical staff who can um, go out and um, provide some perhaps floodplain mapping um, and, and uh, put together a report uh, that kind of lists out the hazard assessments that, and that report can be used as a preliminary tool um, to have some options for how to address the flood problem. And um, that report can often be used to pursue additional funding. Emergency action planning. Um, if a community is looking to create a uh, emergency action plan specific to flooding, or if they have an emergency action plan that they just want to have updated and they need, <clears throat> excuse me, the support, uh, like the um, the kind of labor uh, support and um, just. Uh, provide some templates and things like that. Uh, Silver Jackets has all sorts of great resources for emergency action planning um, and uh, can help with that. We do a lot of education and outreach under Silver Jackets. Um, out of the Sacramento district, our team was just at the Sacramento High Water Jamboree um, last fall. And I think we had about 1200 folks come through for that. We had our um, water table set up so it makes for a real interactive experience for the kids to be able to um, kind of see how how the water goes to the lowest point and you know we have some little monopoly houses that we try to set at the higher points to demonstrate you know um, how how the water and um, you know the homes and other structures kind of interact and what levees and flood walls and some of these other uh, structural um, examples can can do for communities. Um, we've had projects where we've put together bilingual uh, flood zone warning door hangers. Um, so if there is a community um, who has maybe some resources, but they're looking for the bilingual uh, component, um, we can often find that in house and. Um, we're actually, I think, as an um, entity and uh, as the core, we're in the process of uh, refining this resource as well. So um, we look forward to hearing more about what might be available in the future for translation and interpretation services. But this is something we've been able to uh, develop in the past. Uh, activity sheets. Uh, flood after fire guides and other flood risk guides. And I will add the link uh, links in the chat if you want to check out the Flood After Fire California Toolkit, which is a technical resource uh, to assess flood and debris flow risk after a wildfire. And uh, also, there is a community guide um, on after the wildfire. We can also provide support to the National Flood Insurance Program a community rating system. Um, Often in the smaller communities, there's maybe a single floodplain manager or, um, you know, there's not 
um, a lot of maybe support for um, who's helping to run this. And uh, we are often able to come in and help to analyze uh, the community's current score and maybe make some recommendations or suggestions for how they might be able to improve on some of the different activities. Um, and the benefit of that, if, if the community is given a better score on their uh, community rating system, um, is that the residents would be paying a lower premium for flood insurance. So awesome direct impacts um, for some of these types of services. And the last item I'll just mention is uh, planning studies and watershed assessments. Um, so similar to the floodplain mapping and hazard assessments, um, if there is a, a community that you're aware of, or if your community um, is interested in um, discussing some water resource problems or opportunities um, to improve uh, the watershed, um, Silver Jackets can be a good starting point for looking at those type of assessments. And I think I am out of time for today, so I will just leave our program manager's contact information. If you have any other questions about Silver Jackets projects or you have um, some ideas, uh, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our main event for today. Uh, we have Mr. Matt Griffin from Santa Barbara County Flood Control District uh, with us to share on um, debris basins challenges and successes. Over to you, Matt. Great, thank you, Danae. Uh, let me try to share my screen. And start the presentation. You guys seen that okay? Looks great. Excellent. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Matt Griffin, um, engineering manager for Santa Barbara County uh, Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Uh, thank you, Danae and Sampson, for the invitation uh, to speak to the Silver Jackets uh, group. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, this will uh, be of interest to everyone. Um, let me see here. So, in 2018, uh, Santa Barbara County, or the south coast of Santa Barbara County, experienced a, a pretty severe debris flow. Uh, and then in 2023, January this year, um, like most of California, we experienced some pretty significant um, storms and flooding uh, and debris laden flood events. Uh, and so, this presentation is just to share our experiences um, through those two events. Um, and what's come out of uh, what's resulted out of those. Um, so these two photographs here, the one on the left uh, is from 2018. Uh, the road going through the middle is East Valley Road. Uh, and to the left of that is Randall Road. Um, we've identified coming out of that 2018 event, we identified uh, a potential debris basin location, a new debris basin location here. Uh, and then the picture on the right is Park Lane, also in Montecito. Um, and we identified a potential new debris basin in this location too. Uh, so that's just a, a primer for, for the rest of uh, the presentation here. Um, so starting back in the beginning, um, debris flows, debris laden of flood events, uh, have been a known quantity in Southern California for, for quite a while. I, I think the first debris basins were built by LA County dating back to the 1920s. This photograph here, I think is from the 1934 La Crescentia debris flow uh, in the San Gabriel Valley, which killed um, over 40 people. So to orientate ourselves a little bit, uh, Santa Barbara County is there in red. Uh, we're in Southern California, sort of uh, the Southern part of uh, the Central Coast. Um, this is a uh, map of uh, topography. Uh, the Southern part of the county um, has the San Ynez mountain range. Uh, that mountain range runs uh, East and West. 
Um, to the south of the mountain range uh, is the developed areas of uh, Carpinteria, Montecito, Santa Barbara, and, and Goleta. Uh, we have a, a network of debris basins uh, above um, above these cities um, to protect from debris flows uh, and debris laden floods. Uh, this is a graphic I found that I thought was was pretty interesting. Um, you know, debris flows and related floods uh, have been happening for thousands of years, of course, uh, here in the south coast of Santa Barbara and really throughout Southern California, where you have these very tall mountain ranges. Uh, you'll get uh, formations of alluvial fans. Uh, those are developed um, when debris is scoured uh, and deposited um, below the mountains. Uh, what will happen is uh, a channel will be formed. You'll get a debris flow. The channel will scour and fill. Um, and then the creek will find a new location uh, to deposit new material into. So you, you have a wide sweeping range of, of debris deposits and these remnant uh, creek channels, um, which is fine when there's no development. But when you're in an urban or suburban environment, um, you know, the this uh, alluvial fan flooding can be pretty catastrophic. Uh, so unless it's managed or controlled. Um, yeah, so this is just a photograph of Montecito. Uh, Montecito was the most heavily hit uh, from the 2018 debris flow. Uh, the San Ynez mountain range is there in the background. These mountains extend close to 4,000 feet. Uh, so you have uh, these mountains and then just a few miles uh, to the south, you have the Pacific Ocean. Uh, basically all of Montecito is an alluvial fan. This is a map of uh, of our debris basin network uh, on the south coast of Santa Barbara. Um, Montecito is kind of here in the middle. Carpinteria is here to the east and, and Santa Barbara is here to the west. We have about 18 to 20 uh, debris basins that we maintain. Uh, most of these debris basins were built after uh, fires, uh, so they were emergency responses. Um, this here is just a cover sheet uh, from some Army Corps of Engineering uh, flood emergency protection work. Um, this one is for the 19th, is in response to the 1964 Coyote Fire, uh, which built a series of debris basins um, above Santa Barbara and Western Montecito. Uh, and then uh, in response to the 1971 Romero fire, there was a series of debris basins that were built in Eastern Montecito and Carpinteria. Uh, um, this is a picture of what those Army Corps of Engineer basins um, uh, look like. Uh, they were all sort of built as basins of opportunity meaning that um, they weren't necessarily designed for uh, expected debris generation from the watershed. They were basically built to um, the space that was available for them to be built. Uh, understanding that they would provide a, a protection benefit to the community, but um, you know, not a 100% protection benefit to the community. Uh, Typically, they're built with a, an earthen embankment. Uh, here in the, the upper picture, the creek runs from, from top to bottom. Uh, they excavated out uh, a basin, placed an earthen embankment on the downstream end. Uh, they would armor that embankment with grouted rock, and then they would place a, uh, a low flow pipe. In this case, it was a 48 inch uh, RCP uh, low flow pipe. It, you know, in the bottom of the basin to keep to keep water moving. Um, 
with the intent. The intent of these basins is not really to um, impound water uh, or to, to uh, detain it for any significant amount of time. It's just to slow the water down um, to promote the deposition of uh, large, larger rock and to capture um, woody debris. Uh, we do have one debris basin uh, that was, well, we have a couple now, but um, we do have one debris basin that was built in the 1970s and 80s uh, that was designed um, based on um, debris that was expected to be generated from a burned watershed. Uh, that is our Santa Monica debris basin. It was built as part of our Carpentry Valley watershed project. Actually, it was built by the Soil Conservation Service uh, and Santa Barbara County Flood Control was the local sponsor. Uh, Carpinteria, um, like Montecito, had a significant history of uh, debris flows, debris laden floods. Um, and, and so the federal government came in with this uh, project. Uh, it's been quite successful. It basically consists of, of one very large debris basin, Santa Monica debris basin, and then a series of concrete line channels. Um, and, and having concrete line channels below debris basins is a, a pretty important aspect, especially for these big giant um, engineered debris basins. Uh, because when you strip out um, debris and sediment uh, from the flows, um, those flows then, uh, when they're discharged downstream and they don't have that bed load, uh, they become more erosive. Uh, so without these concrete line channels, you would just get more scour um, downstream and then that scour would deposit you know, below that. Uh, this is an aerial picture of uh, the Santa Monica Derby Basin. Um, let me see here. So you see the spillway to the right. Uh, there are, to the left, uh, there are three inlet in, intake towers um, that discharge through a low flow conduit to the south. Um, the top of this tower here uh, to the left is the same elevation as the spillway invert to the right. Um, and that's uh, a little over 40 feet um, vertically above the bottom of the basin. Um, so challenges with your, with our debris basins, uh, and this is going back before yeah, 2018. Uh, most of our creeks uh, on the south coast of Santa Barbara are designated um, steelhead uh, trout critical habitat. Um, meaning that uh, it's, it's very difficult to build new structures in, in those creeks um, to the point where uh, the permitting agencies threatened our ability to do routine maintenance uh, in these creeks. Most of these creeks are natural creeks, um, except for Carpinteria, which has, you know, the concrete lining. Most of the creeks through Montecito and Santa Barbara are, um, are managed natural systems. Uh, and the permit agencies uh, basically threatened our permits uh, to do any maintenance in these creeks unless we um, try to improve the fish passage ability of uh, the debris basins, mostly those core built um, debris basins with the grouted rock embankments uh, across the across the creek. Um, additional challenge is that a lot of these debris basins retain um, a high level of sediments and gravel which um, uh, we would like to see uh, move downstream because that, uh, as I mentioned before, that does prevent, uh, you know, bank erosion downstream. Uh, it's just, you know, part of the natural process uh, for creek health. Um, and then, of course, when you capture that gravel and sediment, you then have to, um, you have to remove it and dispose of it. And so there's, there's a pretty big cost associated with that extra, uh, volume of material, um, and it'd be nice not not to uh, have to deal with that. Uh, and then a, a third challenge is is where to dispose of that material. Uh, the south coast of Santa Barbara is, has very limited uh, open space. Um, land prices are very expensive. Um, finding disposable sites that are are practical and um, 
financially feasible is a challenge. So going back to 2009, um, understanding those challenges, uh, the district came up with a sort of an experimental project. Uh, this is our Gubernador Debris Basin um, ba uh, in Carpinteria. Um, you know, the original design, as we saw with Romero, was a, a grouted rock earthen embankment uh, with a low flow pipe um, at the bottom. Uh, completely in, in uh, passable to fish. Um, the picture on the upper right is, I believe, from 2000. No, I'm sorry, it's from 1995, um, before the basin was modified. Uh, we had a huge, that was a very wet year. Um, we had huge storm events in 1995. You can see that um, there's quite a bit of silt and, and finer grain material that built up in the basin. Uh, in 1995, and all that had to be removed uh, as emergency work. Um, you'll notice that there are some trees in the basin. Our permits uh, require us to leave uh, a certain amount of vegetation in the basin um, unless it reaches 25% uh, of volume of the basin or more, or if there's a burned watershed. Uh, if there's a burned watershed, then we can go in and basically recapture and clean bare uh, the debris basin. In 1995, it was not a burned watershed, so there was some vegetation in the basin uh, prior to the storm events. Um, uh, and so our design concept here was more of an open channel um, that would promote fish passage. It would promote um, uh, the transport of the finer grain materials, the cobbles, the, the gravel and sediment through um, you know, through the basin. Uh, basically, it, re it involves um, removing the grouted rock embankment and replacing it with um, some concrete um, debris walls upstream on the upstream face, which is intended to, again, sort of slow down the water within the basin and to capture um, woody debris. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is from January of this year. Uh, you can see, it was kind of hard to see, but um, the material that was captured in the basin itself is less um, fine than what was captured in 1995, um, and we captured more uh, woody debris too. So both of those are, are benefits. So, uh, And the regulatory agencies were, were mostly happy with the fish passage. So uh, this was a, a successful uh, modification to those debris basins, um, which uh, you'll see later that we're we're continuing to pursue. Uh, Thomas Fire, uh, let me see. Thomas Fire started December, um, I think, thirteenth of two thousand seventeen. At the time, it was the the largest wildfire in the state of California's history. Uh, I think it's been surpassed since then. Um, and, and the fire burned. Uh, the San Inez mountain range above Carpinteria and Montecito. It did not uh, extend to Santa Barbara because there were some burn scars there from that were less than 10 years old. And, and so once the fire hit that old burn scar, it sort of petered out and stopped. Uh, on January 9th, um, so less than a month after the, the largest fire in the state of California's history, um, we had uh, some rainfall, uh, uh, rainfall that came. It, it was really a perfect storm. Um, you see on the left, uh, it, it was. It did not have necessarily a high amount of rainfall volume, um, but it had incredibly high rainfall intensities. Uh, let me see. Our Summerlin gauge had. Uh, almost half an inch in five minutes. Um, Dalton Tunnel had six tenths of an inch in five minutes. Jameson Reservoir had six tenths of an inch in five minutes. Our hydrologists ran the numbers and, and these are roughly on the order of uh, a 200 year recurrence interval for five for five minute uh, rainfall intensities. Um, and debris flows uh, really are triggered by rainfall intensities, not so much um, 
you know, overall rainfall amounts and, and flood flooding amounts, but they're triggered by rainfall intensities, and we had these astronomical rainfall intensities. Uh, and you see yesterday we ran through these slides a little bit, and, and Samson asked about, uh, well, how about a, an early warning system? Um, it, is that feasible? Did you do you have one? Really, for for South Coast of Santa Barbara, these watersheds are so flashy. They have a very small time of concentration, you know, from half an hour to an hour range. Um, that there's really not a chance to have an early warning system. Once the rain is on the ground, uh, there's no practical way to um, to ev make evacuations or do anything except to uh, um, you know shelter in place. Uh, let me see here. You can see the timings of these five minute intensity uh, peaks, um, you know, around 3 uh, 38 a.m. Uh, in the morning. Um, and then our Montecito Creek stream gauge was destroyed between 349 and 404. So, really, within a half hour, less than a half hour from these peak rainfalls, we've had massive debris flow. Um, hit Montecito. Um, you know, a lot of the, uh, in lieu of an early warning system, we really rely on the National Weather Service. Um, I saw, I think, uh, Jamie Labor joined us. Uh, he's from the Oxnard LA uh, office uh, for the National Weather Service. They do a great job of um, providing the public um, with storm thresholds, storm warnings, uh, and working with us and our Office of Emergency Management to um, develop thresholds for potential uh, debris flows. Uh, you can see here that for ahead of the debris flow in 2018, they had thresholds um, for rain for debris flow being triggered at 0.5 inches in one hour, and we were getting over 0.5 inches in five minutes. Um, yeah, so the debris flow was, was quite catastrophic, uh, 23 fatalities, uh, hundreds of homes uh, destroyed. The upper right picture is, is again, uh, Randall Road. This is one of our um, locations that was identified uh, for a potential new debris basin. Uh, the bottom picture is Montecito Creek is there on the left. There's a a small section of concrete line channel, and that concrete line channel empties into our uh, Montecito Creek debris basin, um, which was built to protect the neighborhood downstream from there because in 1995 and 1998, with debris laden flows, uh, a bunch of debris uh, deposited in the creek in that downstream stretch uh, and flooded out the neighborhood. Uh, and it really in 2018, it really represented a stark contrast between debris-laden flows and debris flows, because the debris flow acted uh, entirely different. The debris flow up, this is Olive Mill Road, upstream of Olive Mill Road, uh, the debris flow, just for the, the dynamics they have, it has, it moves faster, it has more momentum. Uh, typically, um, all of the, uh, the big heavy debris that the front face of a debris flow, whereas in a, a debris laden flood, you know, the debris really arrives with the peak of the hydrograph. Um, so the debris flow, it basically jumped the channel and all went down Olive Mill Road. Very little material was deposited in Montecito Creek debris basin. Uh, but this year, 2023, which is more of a debris laden flood, um, Montecito Debris Basin was full to the brim and undoubtedly saved uh, the neighborhood to the south. Uh, yeah, just a picture showing um, how extreme an event the 2018 debris flow was. Uh, that front wave of debris, easily 20 feet tall in, in some locations, uh, boulders, you know, 15 foot in diameter. It, is pretty amazing.
Uh, this is a picture of uh, the Santa Monica Debris Basin that we saw the aerial of earlier. Um, to the right is that uh, emergency spillway. Uh, and so it, it filled to the brim. Uh, I mentioned before, it's about 40 feet deep. Uh, so the, the debris here really stratified. You see the, the floatables on top. Uh, below that, we found a lot of finer materials and you get your gravels and cobble. Uh, at the very bottom, you know, we were finding those 15 foot diameter boulders. Um, upstream of here, there was a private creek crossing um, that had a steel truss bridge. We pulled that steel truss bridge out of this debris basin also. So coming out of 2018, um, FEMA makes available, uh, they, they have a hazard mitigation grant program. Um, you know, these become available after federally declared disasters um, to pr promote uh, the community to build uh, resilient um, infrastructure, new infrastructure that mitigates for future disasters. Uh, so we aggressively pursued um, this program. Uh, we partnered with Cal OES. Uh, Cal OES is, is the uh, prime applicant and uh, typically the local agencies are, are the sub-applicants. So we were the sub-applicant to Cal OES um, coming out of the 2018 debris flow disaster. Um, and we identified, I think we we've been awarded five projects. Um, uh, three of which were modifications to existing debris basins. So we have Cold Springs Debris Basin, San Ysidro and Romero. Um, those three debris basins uh, we um, put into the HMDP program to pursue that gubernador debris basin style modification where uh, we more efficiently trap the bigger debris and pass through the, uh, the finer debris. Um, Santa Monica debris basin, um, performed magnificently uh, in the 2018 debris flow. Unlike Montecito, there was very little damage um, out of bank flow uh, in the area of Carpinteria. Um, so it did its job. Uh, it was hu hugely successful uh, to the point where, um, you know, Montecito had catastrophic death and damage uh, they were very helpful for all the help they could get. Uh, the city of Carpinteria seemed more concerned about complaining about uh, the truck traffic to clean out that debris basin. They they really had no idea um, that that debris basin really saved uh, their community. Um, it, I have no doubt that they would have experienced um, significant property damage and potentially some loss of life without that debris basin there. Uh, so we pursued um, HMGP grants uh, for Cold Springs, San Ysidro, and Romero. Uh, since uh, the Santa Monica Debris Basin um, was built by the Soil Conservation Service, uh, we, uh, well, we're pursuing a project there for some operational improvements. It's not quite the same as the modifications to the other two. Um, this one, is not a steel habitat, uh, steel steelhead trout habitat creek. So it's not necessarily being modified in the same way as those other ones. Uh, we're just making some operational improvements there. And the NRCS uh, is paying for that separately. It's not part of the HMGP grant program. Uh, and then separately from the debris basin modifications, we're pursuing uh, as part of that HMGP grant program, the construction of two new debris basins uh, one is on Buena Vista Creek off of Park Lane, and the other is um, Randall Road off of East Valley Road. Uh, we were not uh, successful initially um, in getting grant funding for all those projects, uh, but we were very aggressive in, in working with uh, Cal OES, and eventually all five of those projects were, were funded. Um, Romero Debris Basin uh, was completed last year, 2022. So um, again, original design, grouted rock embankment with a low flow pipe. Uh, 
and the modification removed that grouted rock embankment and constructed these concrete deflector walls. Uh, this is upstream of the concrete deflector walls. Um, this is, you know, November, uh, I'm sorry, I put in November 2024. This is November 2022. Uh, there's a pilot channel that runs through the basin that is uh, another fish passage component. It also promotes uh, sediment transport through the system. And then what it looked like in January of this year is this. Um, uh, so again, it did do its job in capturing the larger diameter debris. Uh, you don't see it here, but there is a, a log jam uh, between these two concrete deflector walls. Uh, so we are capturing the, the woody debris also. You know, that's stuff that we don't want to go downstream. Um, but we are, you know, there's not a lot of finer grain material here within the basin that is being transported downstream. So that's, that's good for two reasons, of course. One, we don't have to then remove that material. Uh, and two, um, it's good for the health downstream. It, it helps prevent uh, erosion downstream because most of these creeks, again, are natural. They don't have the concrete line, lining to prevent erosion. Uh, and then uh, this is our Randall Road um, project site. It included uh, eight parcels above East Valley Drive. Um, you can see here in this aerial that it looks like two, maybe two structures still were in place after the debris flow. Uh, but prior to the debris flow, there were eight houses uh, on each of these eight parcels. So a lot of those houses were taken right off their foundation. Um, within this immediate vicinity, within these eight parcels and immediately downstream, there were four fatalities. Um, and how did we know that this, well, this was identified as a debris basin site because one, um, this is where the debris accumulated in 2018 uh, it, and it had a long history of also accumulating debris here in past events. Uh, and so it was just really a natural spot that if we could obtain these parcels uh, to just build a debris basin there. Uh, this is San Ysidro Creek uh, at Glen Oaks Road, which is uh, just downstream of the debris basin. Just to give you um, some history, uh, picture on the left was taken in 1964, which is the same year as the Coyote Fire. Picture on the right is 2019, so that's the year after the debris flow, where we still had a burned and impaired watershed. Um, but that location filled in almost exactly the same way. Usually there's an incised you know, creek in here. Uh, same neighborhood, same house, 1969, 2018, and its neighbor across the street, same house, 1969 on the left, 2018 on the right. Uh, so the Randall Road debris basin was completed in uh, July of last year. This is an aerial photograph of the completed uh, basin. Um, the design for this basin, well, so San Ysidro Creek runs along the left-hand side of the basin, uh, and then it crosses under East Valley Road uh, at, the, at the bridge there. So there really is no downstream control for this basin. Um, it sort of mimics our modifications in that way. Uh, the way we were able to permit this is essentially we left the original natural creek channel in place and excavated to the west of the creek channel to create the basin. So we actually did not get into the bottom of the creek um, at, at all when we built this channel, when we built the basin. We just excavated down. Um, leaving, you know, a three to four foot bank on the right, uh, and then excavated all that material off to the to the west. Uh, these racks in the middle of the basin are intended to uh, promote uh, debris capture um, and debris buildup. And this basin uh, performed very well 
in January of 2023 also. This is what it looked like um, in, in January. So uh, January this year was not a debris flow, it was a debris laden flood where the material didn't you know show up all at once with the front wave um, of material coming down the hill. Uh, debris really showed up with the peak of the hydrograph. Um, it comes down the channel. Once um, that peak of the hydrograph um, reaches the basin, the water spreads out into the basin, it slows down, it promotes uh, velocities to decrease, uh, the debris drops out, uh, the channel fills in, uh, the channel fills in, the creek finds a new path, um, and more debris gets deposited into the debris basin. So that's exactly what happened here in January. It worked very well. In this case, uh, we were fortunate enough um, that the California National Guard cleaned out, came in and cleaned out um, the Randall Road Debris Basin for us. Um, all other work uh, associated with the January storm, uh, flood control had to uh, pursue as emergency contracts. Uh, it's very expensive. Um, so, you know, we have that series of 19 debris basins. Um, most of those were filled in to some extent. Uh, so we had to come in uh, except for Randall Road, under our own forces or under our emergency contracts, we had to clean out our, our debris basins ourselves. Um, prior to January of this year, our South Coast flood zone reserves were on the order of 20 to $25 million. And right now our reserves are um, less than $5 million. Um, so it's very expensive. Uh, after the debris flow of 2018, that was such an extreme event that FEMA uh, mission tasked the Corps of Engineers to come in and they came in and they cleaned out all the debris bases at their own expense. Um, so what do we do with all this debris? Uh, fortunately, in 2018 and this year, our environmental staff was able to permit uh, emergency disposal of most of this material. It had to meet certain uh, parameters um, for organics and, and cobble size, but most of that material actually could be deposited directly into the into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is Goleta Beach, um, where most of the material went. We also had a disposal site in Carpinteria Beach. Uh, simply back the trucks up and bulldoze it right into the surf zone. Um, which is where the material was going in the first place. So uh, this was controversial, um, both publicly and and um, at the permit level um, side. Uh, but this is something that we think um, is the best solution for debris disposal. Uh, but it might not might always might not always be there. Uh, so that that actually concludes the presentation. Um, let me see this photo here. I I went to YouTube and I found some videos and I I, I wasn't able to link to the video, but I thought that, uh, it, this picture showed it pretty well. Uh, I, I was going getting into the difference between a debris flow and a debris laden flood. This is a debris flow where you can see these huge rocks are right at the front face of uh, the material coming down. Um, this is what happened in 2018, but that's not what happened in 2023. Um, so that pretty much concludes uh, the presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Matt. That was yeah, really fascinating and amazing to learn about. Uh, the different deb debris basin um, projects that are in Santa Barbara County. I haven't seen any questions come through the chat yet, but we do just have a couple minutes. Um, if folks would uh, like to come off of mute or add anything to the chat, I'll get us to the. Sorry, flip through real quick here.
going once. Oh, here we go. Okay, so Scott is asking, how quickly are you able to clear the basins, especially given the potential onslaught during an active winter? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and that's a huge challenge. Um, it, it depends on how accessible these basins are. Uh, Randall Road is quite accessible, um, but even with the uh, National Guard coming in there and doing most of the work, they actually work 24-7. Uh, it took them about three weeks to clean out that basin. Um, it took us uh, probably a month to clean out Santa Monica. Um, so, you know, this past year, we had that at atmospheric river where one storm built after one after another. Um, uh, so you, there's a, a huge need to get these things cleaned out as soon as possible. Um, but it, it, it takes on the order of uh, weeks usually. We have another question that just came through the chat. Hansel is asking, can you describe total costs of the emergency cleanout again? What occurs if the district exceeds the reserves? <laughs> um, vague. At that point, we'll probably look for um, uh, state and federal help. Uh, if we've totally exhausted our ability to do work, uh, we then go to the next level. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, um, Miranda is asking on slide 23, is that a gauge monitor resting on top of the debris structure? I can flip back to slide 23. Miranda, is that slide 23 in the master slide deck or in uh, Matt's slides? Oh, slide 25. Oh, on Matt's slides, oh, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, if you can scroll to it, that might be easier. Yeah, I have the master slide deck up and I don't see there. Um, do we have these ones numbered? But um, let me see if I can, Miranda, if we get close, maybe let me know. Oh, Miranda doesn't have sound. It's the Romero debris basin slide. Okay, is that before this map? Oh, we passed it a few slides ago. Okay, sorry to hop around here. Almost there. There we go. Okay, and then the question was, Uh, the one before this, she said. The one before this? Okay. Not that one. Maybe this one here? Yeah, we did not have a, a stream gauge at, at Romero. What, one more. Oh, yeah. So um, that is a, a new... Uh, that's a new gauge that our hydrology team has put in. Uh, I'm not sure if it's active yet because this this project um, just completed. Uh, but yes, that is a, a gauge. But I don't think that's public publicly accessible yet. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question. Has the community surrounding these basins been mostly supportive? We often experience pushback on flood control projects. That's from Scott. Yeah, well, as you would expect, following the debris flow, we had an incredible amount of community support. Um, and the further away you get from that, um, you know, it lessens a little bit. Uh, and certainly it depends on individual um, projects too. Uh, you know, sometimes for our new debris basins, um, we need to acquire new property. Uh, and of course, those property owners have concerns about what that would, how that would would in, impact them. Um, so at, at that level, yeah, certainly there's some pushback. Uh, in general, the community is very supportive of, of these projects, um, but over time that has uh, starting to decrease a little bit. All the more reason to get this work done sooner rather than later. 
Thank you, Matt. And another question from Miranda, uh, same slide. How strong are these barriers when it comes to collecting the large boulders? Um, pretty strong. You know, the way the, the, the debris basins are designed is uh, that the water will spread out at the upstream end, uh, reducing the velocities. So hopefully, at least during the debris-laden floods, uh, the large boulders um, uh, will drop out on the upstream. And then uh, as you get closer to the downstream debris walls, you'll get smaller and smaller sized uh, rock. Uh, of course, that, that's for debris-laden floods. For a debris flow on the scale of 2018, um, you know, we think that this will survive, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we're not entirely sure. Uh, um, that was just an incredible event. You know, if you have a 15 foot diameter boulder moving at 25 miles an hour, we're not sure what, what's going to happen. Uh, and, you know, that's a good point. Um, in improvements to the system, uh, the community is still very much in, in jeopardy. It, there's not a 100% level of protection going on here, um, and there probably never will be. Uh, so really community education and outreach um, needs to be part of the, the solution too. Okay, great. And Miranda posted debris wall. Uh, that's the term. And the last big debris event before 2018 was 1960s. Um, it's probably not to the scale of 2018. Uh, I'm not sure that we've seen anything uh, on the scale of 2018 in the last, you know, 200 years of re recorded history. Um, you know, there's there's always been debris laden floods. Uh, that have occurred here. Um, we did see that one slide uh, showing a debris field in 1964. Uh, that was immediately after the uh, Coyote fire. Um, that may have been a debris flow, uh, but nothing quite on the scale of 2018. And we've had actually, uh, in 2017, we had a debris flow further up the coast, um, El Capitan State Beach. Uh, there was a, a fire there. Um, and there was a, a localized debris flow, but it was a debris flow. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think we are just about out of time for questions. Um, you're getting lots of compliments in the chat. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, but I will pass it over to uh, Samson now to close us out for today. Thank you, Denise. So that concludes our webinar for today. And um, as Matt mentioned, and, and most of you are aware, here in California, we have been experiencing record-breaking wildfires in recent years, and the impacts caused by these wildfires can be drastic when it comes to flood risk in post-fire watersheds, in post-fire landscapes, the loss of vegetation cover, the loss of protective land cover provided by trees, shrubs, and grass radically changes the characteristics of those watersheds, and during Storm events, this results in a, post -fire, in a new post-fire hydrology with diminished infestation capacity and excessive runoff, which in turn increases risk of flooding to communities downslope of burned areas, along with mud and debris flow. So understanding and assessing this post-fire flood risk is critical in coordinating emergency response and preparing and implementing mitigation plans. Uh, next slide, please. So the next in this webinars and uh, this series of webinars number three um, is not scheduled yet. Most probably sometime in July, uh, 2023. We're trying to make this a monthly series, and it will focus on recovery phase of risk management. I'd like to thank the presenters today, Dene and Matt, and also everyone who attended today's webinar, and hope to see you all at the next webinar. And as a reminder, if you think of a Silver Jackets project, which might be a good fit for your community, or if you have some ideas for a potential project, please contact uh, our um, California Silver Jackets lead coordinator, 
Rachel Oliana, uh, her contact information was posted on the chat earlier. Thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day.